it's really an honor and a pleasure to welcome Steve here to the Magnus uh, and for promptly accepting this invitation. That it's a conjunction of, of our events and we're celebrating the publication of other program together with our colleague John Eflin from UC Berkeley, two esteemed historians in, 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 in the Bay Area academic community that uh, don't really need much introductions. Uh, uh, clearly everybody's here because you want to hear what, uh, what the colleagues are about to say. So I just want to remind everybody that at the end of the program there will be a book signing and on the other end of the room. Please join me in welcoming Steve Zipperson yeah. and John Eflin. Good evening. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you here. Um, so thank you for coming. On uh, Easter Sunday, April 6, 1903, a pogrom broke out in Kishinev. When it was over, 49 Jews had been killed, 600 had been raped or wounded, and more than 1,000 Jewish-owned homes and stores were ransacked and destroyed during the two days, or one and a half days, of violence. Now, much like the pogrom itself, which began with some scuffling and some stone throwing in the town square, news of the pogrom spread like wildfire, picking up steam and intensity. It was headline news throughout the Western world, covered especially in the sensationalist Hearst Press in the United States. And the pogrom gripped the world's imagination and put a little known town on the map, as it were. Now, the agony of Kishinev not only shaped Jewish attitudes towards and especially memories of the old country, but weighed heavily on the minds of non-Jews in ways as unpredictable as they were important and long-lasting. Steve Zipperstein has, to quote the late Philip Roth, written about all of this with gripping clarity and admirable brevity. It is, I've now read it twice, it's a page turner, and as brief as it is, I could have stood for even more because it was difficult to put down. So congratulations on that. Um, <clears throat> most of your work, your published scholarly work, has been in the area of Jewish culture, whether it's a study of Odessa or Achad Am or Isaac Rosenfeld. And some of the characters that you've looked at in the past are reprised here, but in a completely different context. But pogrom. Uh, the tilt of history seems to be quite a departure from some of the things you've written before. So I wonder if you could just tell us something about the genesis of the book, what prompted you at this particular time, or how long it, you, you know, you've been thinking about it. Um, yes, I, it, I mean, it is and it isn't a departure. Um, uh, first, thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank you for agreeing to, um, to come. All of you can hear me. Um, yeah. No, hold, hold it close up. Oh, right, right. I, I, I know. I, 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 I've, I, I've often encountered the experience before Jewish audiences that there's someone who says they can't hear you before you begin to talk, and um, <laughs> but um, uh, you, you can hear me now, hopefully. Um, and, and anything I've said before really is irrelevant, and you haven't missed anything. Um, um, yeah, the, the, the book began, as I mentioned briefly, at its start um, as a, um, a cultural hist history of East European and Russian Jewry from the 18th century to the present. And I then decided to, and I had signed a contract with the trade publisher, and then just to organize the research for the book, I subdivided the book into various pieces or what might be the book into various pieces. And the Kishnev pogrom was one of, one of these slices. And I was to spend um, three, four, perhaps five weeks reading as much as I could across the various languages. And as uh, my wife Susan could well attest, I ended up spending many, many more weeks and months and years on this, that particular episode I, I just came to appreciate, and hopefully I make this clear enough in the book, the ways in which this particular episode, when looked at closely, um, explains so much about how Jews came to understand 
themselves over the course of the last century and more, and to some extent how non-Jews have come to understand Jews. I, I also wanted to write a book that was closer to the ground, where I had, where I could actually um, uh, write about people, about people's reactions in a way that would be more intimate than would be true uh, for a broad history. And what I came to appreciate while researching this book um, was that it was this particular incident that occurs really over the course of a, a day and a half in what is, as John had mentioned before quite accurately, a town that is rather obscure even for, for Russians them, themselves at the time. Um, this incident ends up being the most um, well-documented um, incident in uh, Russian Jewish history before 1917. And it ends up being, at the same time, the most mythologized. And, um, and while, while writing it, I was not thinking um, about the phenomenon of fake news that has now enveloped all of our lives, uh, and um, may it soon end. Um, the, um, um, in the end, I, I realized, just while putting the finishing touches on the book, that I was writing about something akin to that phenomenon, the way in which you could have a massive amount of documentation um, accessible to those who then mythologize it and shave away all of the details, or so many of the details, and make of it something that, by and large, it was not. Um, and I think also I wanted to capture that interplay that's so crucial in Jewish life and the way in which Jews understand themselves and are understood by others, that interplay between real persecution, real catastrophe, real tragedy that does occur, and the ways in which Jews have, at times, as the English say, over-egged the pudding, and um, have made catastrophe into something that's utterly normative. Had the Jewish past been as catastrophic as some Jews believe it was, we really would not be here today. And, um, and so it seemed to me that there was a real challenge in actually looking closely at a real catastrophe um, that happened and that was dreadful, and then understanding the interplay between what occurred and what was made of it. And, um, and as I came to dig into it and being able to read across the various um, languages, I came to see that it, it emerged as no less important for others than it did for Jews and became, over the years, um, one of the central bulwarks of, 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 of anti-Semitism, as much as it became one of the major bulwarks of, um, the, that inspired um, the creation of the Haganah, the precursor to the Israeli army, and a variety of other enterprises in Jewish life. And so the, um, in the end, the story just came to be just, it was too good not to tell. And, um, and so I lived with it far, far longer than I ever might have imagined. Right. So you mentioned just now um, the intimacy. Uh, and the book is, for those I assume most haven't yet had a chance to read it, it's an anatomy of a pogrom. And it is as intimate as an anatomy lesson or a dissection uh, itself. Um, but what we know about this town is about this sort of one and a half days. So could you just tell us something about the intimate relations, or intimate or otherwise relations, between Jews and non-Jews in this town? What kinds of Jews lived there? Um, something about sort of the sociology of, of, of the Jewish community. And how were relations between Jews and non-Jews before the events of April 1903. Yeah, it's um, it, it's it's a, a it's a, a good set of questions and 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 uh, uh, questions that are tough to answer. Um, and 
it's part of the, and I'll get to it in a second, but just a general comment about the, um, the writing of history. To some extent, the writing of history is, is similar to the writing of, of fiction and dissimilar from the writing of political science in as much as um, um, historians don't, by and large, ask ourselves to provide theories about what it is that occurred. Um, we try to understand the past um, in its often confounding complexity and then try to offer as, as rich a portrait as possible. And so the, the, the portrait that I offer with regard to Jewish-non-Jewish relations is a, a complicated and in some ways confounding one. And um, to, to get to John's question in just a, a moment, as I, I describe in the chapter of the book, the book is made up of six chapters and only one chapter is devoted exclusively to the pogrom itself because so much of what made the pogrom important is what happened afterwards and what was made of it. Um, um, during the worst moments of the pogrom in an area called Lower Kishnev, and as I walked through Kishinev, it's now called, it, it is still Lower Kishnev. You actually descend into this area in much, this, much the way that Chaim Nachman Bialik describes in his famous poem, Bir Haraga, in the city of, of, of killing. Um, in the, the worst moments of the pogrom, um, witnesses described how the ferocity of, of, of violence between neighbor and neighbor, um, as one woman described, she's actually raped by a, a man who years before she had, um, who had breastfed um, at, at her body. And, um, and at the same time, um, there are many incidents of Jews um, escaping rioters jumping into the courtyards of neighbors, going into, of non-Jewish neighbors, and going into their homes fully expecting to be saved, and they were. And um, so both, um, both sorts of events happened with great frequency. Um, what, how then you could then generalize about Jewish, non-Jewish relations, either during the pogrom or, at, or before the pogrom, is hence complicated. Kishnev is, um, it's a border town. It's in a part of Russia that's carved out of, um, uh, recently out of R Romania. Um, um, the, the town is uh, at, the, at the western edge of, uh, of the, the Russian Empire um, and in a somewhat unsettled um, border um, not far from Romania. Um, Romania seems always unsettled, and, um, and, and just south of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the, the Russian um, government, it seems, doesn't uh, improve the roads of the area in some measure because it's worried about invasion from um, Romania or perhaps from Austria. Hungary, this, the, the, the rail system is, is very, very primitive. The area is an agricultural um, is agriculturally fertile and at the same time um, backward. Um, and Kishnev functions in the area um, akin to, to Fresno. Uh, no insult uh, to Fresno. And um, it's, uh, it's a cow town, although I haven't been to Fresno ever, and so Fresno might be glorious. And so I speak out of complete ignorance. But, but these days, you could do it and be elected president. And um, so um, 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 there, it's a, there's a population of about 110,000, although those numbers are probably not entirely accurate because many of the, the people who live there are, are, are seasonal uh, laborers. Jews make up somewhere between one third and one half of the population. Um, Jews um, uh, dominate almost all of the retail trade, uh, much of the wholesale trade as small town, small time um, wholesalers, um, and they seem all the more, all the more visible, even more visible than they are, because retailers um, are visible. They have shops, and Jews live in the center of town, often near their shops. And so, consequently, um, um, in Kishinev, and this is true uh, um, for Jews elsewhere in Eastern Europe, it seems as if there's way more of them than there there are. And um, uh, Jews insist that relations are amicable. Um, uh, 
the local population um, is even more illiterate than is true elsewhere in the Russian Empire. Um, relatively docile, relatively unenterprising. This is an area where large numbers of Jews come over the course of the 1880s and 90s in order to make, in order to make some, some money. There's no doubt that some Jews take advantage of the docility of the pe peasants, but there's no doubt that non-Jews do as well. The, the crucial element here, and this seems to be a crucial element in the fanning of anti-Semitism elsewhere, <coughs> the fanning of hatred, um, elsewhere, the fanning of hatred in our world today is, um, is the role of ideologues and intellectuals. The, um, um, the, this area, a border area, ends up being the epicenter of the far Russian right, of the so-called Black Hundreds. Uh, there's no group that really calls themselves the Black Hundreds. That's an insulting term. But there is a, a welter of far right groups, and, um, and many of their heroes are, are centered right there in Kishnev. And a number of them, and this I describe in one of the chapters of the book, are at work just before the outbreak of the pogrom on a work that will demonstrate that Jews are at the epicenter of all of the machinations of the world. And um, this work ends up being called, in editions in 1905, 1906, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion are written, or first published, in the immediate wake of the Kishna pogrom. And um, in the immediate wake of a pogrom, that according to the authors of the Protocols, um, demonstrate that Jews actually do control the, um, the, the news in the world, many of the politics in the world. It astonishes local anti-Semites that this, that this pogrom gets the um, attention that it does. It's the first event in Russian Jewish history that garners widespread attention in the Western world. And, um, and just as for Jews, the Kishna pogrom demonstrates that the Russian government is ferment fermenting attacks against them. For anti-Semites, the Kishna pogrom demonstrates that Jews are in control of the sinews of the world, and both are wrong. And these are some of the major lessons that are carried away by different people from the pogrom, and both lessons are based on inaccuracies. Um, I feel like I've, I've, I've shocked you a bit, um, but, uh, but there'll, be, there'll be time to. You, you've shocked me because I wanted to talk at the protocols okay. late, later. Okay. Sorry. So Sorry. We'll, get to, we'll get to it. Um, so this is not the first pogrom. In, in, in modern history, right? I mean, at least since 1881, and there was even beforehand, there's an expulsion from Moscow in 1891. Um, but this is qualitatively different in terms of the world's reaction. And is it, you mentioned fake news, real news, the press in general. Is it the press that plays this role that it doesn't play previously? I mean, there is an international press, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a Jewish press still, you know, well in existence uh, 20 years beforehand. Yeah, there, there are a variety of reasons why this, this becomes what it becomes. And really a lot of what came to preoccupy me is how something enters into history when almost everything else disappears, so much disappears. Um, partly it becomes what it becomes because it, when it happens at the beginning of the 20th century, a century that was ushered in with such hope and the hope that there would be harmony between people. Partly, it, um, it, it, uh, it, it garners the attention that it does because this is a moment where Jewish political movements are at their height. 1903 is before Herzl's death in 1904. The Jewish Socialist Labor Bund is at the height of its popularity. It's an illegal organization with over 30,000 members. It's the largest Marxist organization in Russia, and in some ways one of the largest in, in Europe, certainly one of the best organized. Um, and all of, that it does is surreptitious. It's an event that's embraced across the whole Jewish political spectrum, unlike any other event. It's, it's it, this relatively small numbers who were killed also helps garner attention to it there are 49 Jews who were killed, 47 during the pogrom, two later, a couple of days later from wounds 
incurred during the pogrom. And with 49 dead, you're able to capture all of them in one picture. And uh, in contrast to what occurs, say, on the streets of Odessa in 1905, where there are 500 dead. And um, so a little bit like the curious interplay between the way in which that Syrian boy dead on the beach captured America's attention for about 15 minutes, um, or, or the, the way the function of Anne Frank as someone who you could focus on as a victim of the Holocaust because five, six more million simply one can't contemplate. Um, the relatively small numbers and the way in which they could be captured in one photograph, a photograph that ends up being circulated in newspapers throughout the Western world is a factor. And then there's the role of contingency an accident, and um, one of the most exasperating and delicious um, features of what, it, what it's like to write history. And um, Kishnev is, um, is located right near the most porous of all Russian borders. It's the place with the most bribable authorities, uh, the most corruptible authorities, and the easiest place to actually um, um, send uh, news out from Russia. And consequently, is the place that's designated by the Zionist movement as the location of its correspondence bureau. A correspondence bureau that, that it ends up establishing contacts with newspapers throughout the world. And the correspondence bureau is headed by a, a very stalwart, decent man named Jacob Bernstein Kogan, who um, manages on the end of the second day of the pogrom to collect enough money to send a, hundreds of telegrams to newspapers in the Western world. And um, so, so, so much of the reason why the Kishna pogrom becomes the Kishna pogrom has to do with utter contingency. Had the same events, I'm convinced, happened 200 miles to the east, it, it wouldn't have garnered anything close to the attention. And then, there, there's, there's, um, there's Hearst. Um, um, uh, see if this reminds you of, of anyone. He's um, incredibly rich, politically rapacious, um, constantly lies, has no problem with lying. Um, he's constantly running for political office. He's hoping to run either for the a Democratic ticket as the governor of New York or perhaps for the presidency. He's already in Congress. And, um, and he wants to um, uh, lubricate a, uh, a New York-based um, constituency made up increasingly of a large number of Jews on the Lower East Side. And he makes Kishnev his, his issue. So um, uh, between um, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, potency of Jewish political movements, the, the power of the press, the number of those killed, the location of Kishnev, um, um, all of these conspire in many ways to make this into the event that it, it uh, becomes. There, as John alluded to, there's, there's hundreds, hundreds of, 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 of pogroms that um, cascade through Russia during the constitutional crisis of 1905, 1906, and, and countless um, in, in the wake of the disintegration of the Roman Empire and the rise of Bolshevism between 1918 and 1921 Barely any of these are remembered um, uh, except by Jews from these localities or their descendants. This one, this one becomes the, the totem. This one, it's really only in the wake of this one, as I, as I try to demonstrate in the book, that the term pogrom becomes universal. It's barely known um, in, in, um, uh, at the time of the pogrom in 1903. Uh, within a year or two, it's basically, it's as well known as the words vodka or tsar. It's almost as if it's a part of the English language. And, um, and this has to do with the way in which this incident captures imagination. And you just used the word conspire uh, and conspiracy. <coughs> yeah, you just used the word conspire and the word conspiracy, obviously, and conspiracy plays an important role here. Uh, as it is linked to the press, so you mentioned also Bernstein Kogan who is able to send this out. And this convinces, this convinces the anti-Semites that the Jews had actually manufactured, orchestrated the entire pogrom for the purposes of garnering support and money. I mean, it's exactly the same kind of things that uh, you know, Holocaust deniers uh, 
for the most part, say, right, that it's gone to world sympathy for Israel and to bilk the world of money. Those contemporary claims are heard here, and I don't think they're heard before it. I think it's another innovation of Kishinev that this ability to orchestrate, and then also because you have access to the press, because he's able through this press office, this just confirms for them their a priori belief that the Jews had invented the Kishinev pogrom. Right, and, and <clears throat> the local anti-Semites who accuse the Jews of lying about their contention that the government was responsible for the pogrom, those anti-Semites are accurate. Um, but the Jews who they accuse of lying sincerely believe that they're telling the truth. Just as the anti-Semites who write the protocols, even though they're putting words in the mouth of a so-called elder of the Jews, believe sincerely, I believe, that if they were actually to get that elder to sit down, like in a scene at Homeland, and interrogate him, this is how he would sound. Both are speaking out of sincerity, if also out of inaccuracy. And, and for both, they have dueling texts. The text that's used by Jews, believed by Jews, um, sincerely believed, is a text that surfaces about a month after the end of the pogrom, signed by the Minister of Interior, Pleve. Basically, um, a, a note to the Governor General of the region saying, listen, don't, don't put down the attack. And um, it's widely believed, even by people in Pleva's office, it reminds us a little bit of, of the West Wing, that, that Pleva might have written it. Um, in, in retrospect, we've come to conclude that he did not write it, but it's widely believed that he did. It's so widely believed that Pleva did, did this that he's gunned down and killed the next year because of his complicity in planning the Kishinev pogrom. And um, um, so Jews have, have proof, have documentary proof that, um, uh, that the Russian government is actually responsible for violence on its own streets. This is largely responsible for the relatively unimpeded uh, regulations uh, regarding Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe that are in place up until the beginning of the First World War at a time <coughs> just after um, uh, restrictions against Chinese are reaffirmed in 1902. Um, and in no small measure, the relatively unrestricted immigration to the United States that brought so many of our ancestors here is based on the notion that the Russian government planned the Kishinev pogrom, which is historically inaccurate. Uh, part, of, part of what I found so arresting in writing the book was, was the realization that so much of what I believe, I believe as someone on the left, um, 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 were, were beliefs consolidated based on historical inaccuracies. The fact that these are inaccuracies does not necessarily shatter my beliefs. Um, um, but it's sobering to recognize that so much of what I believe and people I'm close to believe um, is itself predicated on myths. What I came to learn in writing this book is just the, the function of myth. Um, incredibly powerful. History, history, as I've alluded to before, is made of so many pockmarks. You, you stutter when you try to describe an historical event. You equivocate. John asked a perfectly reasonable question. How did Jews and non-Jews get along in Kishnev? And you end up with a 20-minute answer that doesn't really answer the question. Mythology has coherence. Mythology has a marvelous kind of content that's so arresting, far more arresting than facticity. It's probably one of the reasons that right-wing talk radio is so much more powerful. That it's, um, it, it, you, 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 can't, you can't compete with its, its internal coherence. And that's something I came to appreciate while writing this book. Well, so myth, myth is at the heart, I think, and we can have a disagreement about this.
myth is at the heart of uh, the cultural monument, of all cultural monuments that emerges from this, and that's Bialik's poem, In the City of Killing. Um, I'm just going to read one little one, one stanza, because this, this is an, uh, an epic poem called In the City of Killing, or in some translations, The City of Slaughter. And um, it's incendiary all throughout, but there's one particular stanza that I want you to speak to. Come now, and I'll bring thee to their lairs, the privies, jakes, and pig pens, where the heirs of the Hasmoneans lay, with trembling knees, concealed and cowering, the sons of the Maccabees, the seeds of saints, the scions of the lions, who, crammed by scores in all the sanctuaries of their shame, so sanctified my name. It was the flight of mice they fled. The scurrying of roaches was their flight. They died like dogs and they were dead. It's very powerful. He went there as part of the uh, historical commission, the so-called the historical commission, uh, and took a tremendous amount, I think he was there five weeks, taking, taking testimonies. And he paints this picture, an everlasting picture, uh, of Jewish male cowardice that they were hiding. He's not the only one to have done that, and that comes out in, in, your, in your account. Uh, but you quote the literary critic uh, Dan Miron um, and another later Israeli, Noah Peniel, who speak about the, uh, the damage and the defamation. Uh, and that's something that I feel strongly about and think that it was part of a much larger discourse of attacking Jewish manhood at the end of the 19th century, not just in Eastern Europe, but certainly in Western Europe. Um, but this becomes institutionalised insofar as it's a poem that's taught in Israeli schools for a very long time, up until relatively recently. You seem to, to me to um, go a little easy on Bialik or are more sympathetic to his, to his account. He knew, for example, that Jews defended themselves. He knew that Jews had guns, that they went out the next day and scared off some of the attackers in one part of the city by firing guns into the air, and that they were storehousing weapons and, and clubs and crowbars and things like that. He knew that. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't disagree about the impacts and, and the, ultimately, the, ultimately the insidious impact cultural impact, educational impact of uh, Bialik's uh, poem, one of two that he writes um, in the wake of the pogrom. What I tried to, what I discovered while working on this book, um, what I discovered was part of the reason why the pogrom became, the, um, became canonized. Um, in the way that I've described that it, that it, that it, event, that it very soon would be, is because of the, um, the work of, a, of an Irish journalist, um, longtime radical um, named Michael Davitt, who uh, writes in the wake of um, a 10 day or so stay in Kishnev, um, uh, the first best selling book in any Western language on uh, the Jews of Russia. Uh, in fact, uh, this I couldn't. Prove and so I don't say it in the book, but the um, the term "pale of settlement" itself is not a translation from the Russian. Uh, the tra tra translation from the Russian is the line of settlement, and I think, though I can't prove, that the popularization of the term "pale," which is widely used in Irish circles to describe the fortified um, the, f the the the, the uh, fortified Dublin in the Middle Ages it ends up being popularized because the term appears in the title of Michael Davitt's book. Michael Davitt um, 
um, covers um, the, the, the impact of the pogrom, writes this best-selling book, becomes a Jewish folk hero. There's Yiddish poetry written about Michael David, numerous plays written about Michael David for Broadway and elsewhere. Um, once, when he dies a few years after his time in Kishtev, he's, um, he's, he's, uh, his, his, uh, he's, he's mourned akin to the mourning of a, of a great rabbi. And um, I was able to, my, biographies of Michael David indicate that he was a copious note taker. And I tracked his notes down to Trinity College Dublin. Um, the archives, actually the archives are just upstairs from a room where a lot of the Harry Potter um, uh, films are, are, are shot, a, a beautiful room. Uh, the archives rather, rather more mundane. And uh, when I first contacted the archivist about seeing the material, they said, yes, his notes are here, but you can't really see, you can't see them because the paper is too delicate. And I'd worked fairly extensively in Russian archives and figured that what you can do in an archive is you come there and you look at other material and they see, frankly, that you're a mensch and you know how to turn pages and eventually they take pity on you because you've flown in from California. And, um, and that's what happened. Uh, now, Michael David was um, fixated on facticity and his impressions of the behavior of Jews in Kishinev was identical to that of Bialik. So what I ended up writing about, at least at the end of the chapter, is the argument that for Bialik, um, who obviously doesn't include everything in his poem, though in many ways the, the, foam, the poem is um, uh, almost, uh, provides an almost photographic portrait of various aspects of, of the town, uh, of its topography, and of the violence itself, what he does in the poem with reference to his lacerating um, um, treatment of Jewish males is that he includes in his poem something that journalists at the time were loath to include, especially when you describe a vulnerable people. Um, vulnerable people uh, tend all the more assiduously to protect their family secrets. We tend all the more assiduously to protect our family secrets. Um, it seemed to me that what, uh, what, what Bialik was doing in the poem was situating a family secret that was well known at the time, but that people weren't, weren't going to be publicizing in the poem, um, um, uh, partly so that he, partly because he could, also for reasons that I describe in the book, he's enormously overwhelmed by the, by the events in Kishnev. The, the, the events in Kishnev changed Bialik's life in so many ways. It's in the wake of his poem that he becomes really um, uh, feted as the national poet um, of, of Hebrew, of, of the Jewish people, um, even beyond the writing of Hebrew. He also falls in love with a woman who's not his, his wife in Kishnev, is contemplating leaving, leaving her. He's, his, his life is turned inside out by the Kishnev pogrom for reasons uh, clear and less than clear. Did he ever come to regret the impact of the poem in the same way that, say, Abba Kovner later regretted using the expression like lambs to the slaughter. Not that I know of. I mean, Hannah Kronfeld's here, and she, she, she might know better than me, but I, um, I don't believe he ever, ever regrets it. Um, he ever regrets it. And he, he already comes to Kishnev without really knowing a great deal about what occurs there, um, assuming as do as does the, his entourage in Odessa, built around Chada'am, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Zionist, liberal Zionist thinker, uh, that this is how Jewish males behaved. It's a skewed portrait. It's a profoundly incomplete portrait. It's an unfair portrait. But the poem does contain information that otherwise is, uh, otherwise is, is removed elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that's why I argue what I do. Right. But I do, do conclude that chapter with a discussion of, of Peniel, yes. who I had known about, a leading Jewish educator in, the, in, in, in Israel, in the Yeshua first and then in Israel, um, who spent much of his adult life as an admirer of, of Bialik's, but who tried to, tried to mute the impact of this poem mm -hmm. um, in the uh, Israeli educational system. Right. You also say in the book that one of the reasons that the resistance, and there was, there was considerable resistance when it was possible, uh, why that wasn't publicized and why it wasn't known is that it was essentially non-ideological. That is to say, it wasn't 
it wasn't the purchase of either Bundists, who were the first to really resist in Eastern Europe, or Zionists, but it was just people who did what people usually do when they're being attacked, try to defend themselves. Right. It, it, but there see, was no one to write their story, as it were, no official, no official medium through which their tale could be told. There's no political party that owns the resistance. Yeah. And so consequently, it happens and it dies. I mean, among the curious features of this event is that those who speak most um, um, vociferously um, uh, and vehemently about Jewish resistance are anti-Semites, who actually argue in the various trials, and there are a whole spate of trials that pogromists are tried in clusters beginning in the summer and then through December 1903, that um, all that happened was there was a, a sort of party on the first day, but then Jews are so aggressive and fought back, fought so ridiculously aggressively that Christians were simply defending themselves and then Jews called it a pogrom. So um, it's, it's the, the non-Jewish defenders of anti-Semites and the pogromists who speak about Jews being, being, being aggressive and, and in the canonic Jewish accounts, um, um, Jews, Jews are engaged in, 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 in shameful, uh, passive um, uh, behavior. During the summer, as you know, in May, I went to, to Poland and I went to visit my mother's house uh, in Radom, which is about 50 miles south of Warsaw. And of course we get there and there's a Polish flag flying, flying from the balcony and because Poland does, uh, continues to do weird things to Jews who go to visit it, uh, it turns out that the, the current government, the Law and Justice Party's headquarters are in my mother's apartment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was taken there and shown around the town by a couple of very well-meaning young people. Twelve kilometres from Radom, there's a small town called Pshitik. And in Pshitik in 1936, there was a pogrom. And I mentioned this, my grandfather was from Pshitik but had moved to the Big Smoke, to Radom, which was a city of 100,000 people, uh, just before. And I said there was a pogrom. And he said, why do you call it a pogrom? I said, because it was a pogrom. He goes, no, the Jews were armed. Right. <laughs> and this is from a well-meaning person, not an anti-Semite, but this idea that as soon as you begin to defend yourself, you're the aggressor or you, are, you should come to expect some sort of response from, from non-Jews uh, is still alive and well. Oh, sure. So it exactly confirms what you're saying here. Um, you mentioned before the protocols. Maybe you could say a little bit more about how you, your, your discovery of yeah. some documents and uh, Pavel Khrushchevan. So, I mean, um, not only is there contingency in history, there's complete accident um, and sometimes um, marvelous accident when you're doing um, research. Um, so I, I'd long been interested in the origin of the protocols and um, and others had actually drawn the connection between the Kishinev pogrom and, um, and the first version of the protocols, an obscure version that appears in a newspaper that's only bought by subscription, very hard to get hold of even at the time of its appearance in Petersburg in, um, in, in 1903. Um, but I'd heard, um, I'm, you end up, um, uh, um, over the course of the research for this, book, I ended up uh, becoming friendly with Irish historians because of Michael Davitt. They tend to drink more than um, other historians and, um, and uh, not to, 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 um, to, to feed stereotypes. And, um, and, uh, and I'd heard from a, a small group of people who were experts on the, the first version of the, the pro, of the protocols that there was a, a Jew from Kishinev living in Brookline who had something. And I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to Kishinev, and I'm finishing the book. I think it's basically done. And I come see this man. And I'm talking with him. And um, he says, um, yes, I have something. And he takes off of his um, shelf um, um, some of the most personal and, um, and um, 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 uh, embarrassing um, uh, documents about the first publisher Khrushchev is the first publisher 
of the protocols, and by general consensus now, he's understood to be one of the, one of, one of the first authors or co-authors of the first version. Um, this man um, um, in Brookline, this Kishinev Jew, um, had been a journalist um, in the Soviet period, had written a book about a psychiatric hospital at the edge of Kishinev. In the psychiatric hospital was Khrushchev's nephew. Khrushchev died young of cancer at the age of 49 and childless, and, um, and gave these documents to the nephew. The nephew dies, the Soviet Union implodes, N nothing belongs to anybody, and, um, and so consequently, this um, Jewish journalist ends up uh, being the owner of um, um, some of the most embarrassing um, papers belonging to one of the arch anti-Semites of late imperial Russia. I'm sitting in his apartment, we're chatting, and he turns to me after an hour or two and he says, do you want to take them with you? <laughs> I, I said to him, you know, I said to him, Misha, we just met. And uh, um, he, he was looking for some place to, to, an institution to, 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 to buy it, eventually the Hoover did buy it and, and it's been cataloged, um, 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 organized at the Hoover. Um, and um, I'm leaving the next day for, for, for Kishinev. I go back to the hotel I'm staying in. I go to the concierge and I ask them, when you find something that's incredibly valuable, how do you ship it? And they say, well, there's a really great FedEx down the street on Newberry. I go to Newberry and I ask them, you know, I th may have the papers of the author of the protocols. What, are, what do you value them at? <laughs> <laughs> and so um, the, the, the papers of the author of the first version of the protocols are, 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 can be insured for, for $50,000. You, you don't pay that. That's the, the amount that if they were lost, they weren't lost. They ended up in my office, and I ended up um, um, being able to um, um, arrange for their sale to the Hoover. But um, um, among these papers, um, and this is a man who continues to reverberate in, um, in, 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 in post-Soviet um, um, anti-Semitic, homophobic culture as a great pioneer of what's called um, in that region Christian socialism, which means anti-Western, anti-capitalism, anti-liberalism, anti-Semitism, um, was his uh, diary that he kept when he was 17 or 18. Um, at the time he's 17 or 18, he's um, having um, uh, very vividly described sex with a Cossack. Uh, of the male persuasion, and um, um, he, um, he wishes he was born a lady, um, um, stating this explicitly and very clearly and talking in some detail in the diary. Um, he's considered in his time the most powerful and the best placed anti-Semite in Russia, and in fact, he's, he's going through serial bankruptcies. I know the kind of wood, his wood is assessed by bailiffs. I know the wood of his desks, the wood of his bookshelves, um, um, the, 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 the assessed value of the, the, the two printing presses that occupy the bulk of his apartment in, um, in, in, in Petersburg. Again, the discrepancy between what you assume you know and what you actually, the complexity of, 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 of life. And so I was able to tell an immeasurably more textured portrait of um, the author of the protocols and the origin of the protocols than I ever could have imagined. Just one last note, and I, we should then open up. So the, the end of the story ends up, um, the end of the story that I tell, it's not the end of the story, um, it ends up actually in the United States. Because what I came to learn was the close connection between the intense preoccupation with pogroms uh, which electrifies so much of the American press, um, but um, a, an electrification that shocks especially African-American activists. Um, and there are a whole host of small newspapers not connected with Booker T. Washington, um, fairly politically radical, that are sympathetic to the fate of Jews in Russia by and large, but, who's, who, but who are astonished that pogroms in Russia so preoccupy American society when lynching so little preoccupies um, um, American society and even so little preoccupies the left in America. And the person responsible uh, largely for the, for the intersectionality, and here I use the term, term I, I think accurately, uh, connecting um, the phenomenon of pogroms to the phenomenon of lynching is a woman named Anna Strinsky, uh, who lives in Berkeley, 
but who is, uh, receives a degree from another university across the bay called Stanford, and uh, is a one-time lover of Jack London's, co-authors a book with Jack London, um, travels in Russia for two years with her um, husband, William Walling, Willing, William English Walling, who in 1908 publishes a book called uh, Russia's uh, Message, uh, the, the most popular book about Russian radicalism before John Reed's 10 Days That Shook the World. John Reed refers to it at the beginning of his book. And, um, and it's while um, um, promoting this book on the stage of Cooper Union that Anna Strunsky quite just quite spontaneously um, says out loud, you know, as bad as pogroms are, lynching is even worse. Lynching is similar. There's an all-night meeting right afterwards, a lot of all-night meetings at turn of the century, Lower East Side, it seems, um, which leads to the creation of what becomes the NAACP in the Strunsky Walling apartment in, um, in September 1908. It's called something else in 1908. It's renamed the NAACP in 1909. And so the, the, the reverberation of the Kishinev pogrom um, actually in American history, in American, American left-wing history and American African-American history is, 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 ends up being very real. In, f in fact, one of the things that you, you'll, you'll, um, you'll see when you read the book towards the latter stages of the book is that this may well be the first instance of intersectionality because the, the, the Yiddish Forvets uh, published in uh, 1917 a story. Um, you know, we're used to seeing now these signs that link Ferguson and Gaza. But in 1917, the Forvets linked Kishinev and a place right near Ferguson, St. Louis. There was a race riot. What's that? East St. Louis. East St. Louis, yeah. There's a race riot there in 1917. And the, and the Yiddish forwards writes of both, Kish, it says, Kishinev and St. Louis, twin sisters that could easily be mistaken for one another. Uh, Steve's book will also take you to Chinatown in New York, where this story resonated there. In a restaurant, I should add which is, you know, typical. But there are remarkable connections that Steve weaves into this story that are unexpected, that are surprising. Um, and it's a beautifully written, a beautifully written study and uh, somewhat miraculous in the way that he's been able to write this in a very, very accessible way and yet l lose none of the nuance nor uh, the scholarly the scholarly integrity that we come to expect from, from Steve Zipperstein. Um, I'd like to open the floor up now to, to some questions for those of you who have them. And yes. So there are these fists created by Yalek or other people who weren't actually there. Is there any record of uh, how the people in Kishinev themselves, I mean the Christians, the non-Jews in Kishinev, how do, what did they think about this? Yeah, um, John and I were just talking about just that before the, the session started. Um, there, there are 900 um, rioters who are arrested, among them some Jews who are attempting to resist the rioters. So the number of pogromists is probably around 800 out of a city of 110,000. Um, the majority of those interviewed by Michael David afterwards say they deplored the violence of course, that's what they said afterwards. Um, there's reason to believe that many of them did, um, even if they, even those who felt ambivalent about Jews. Um, by and large, from the evidence we have, the religious authorities are inimical to Jews, and um, and it's not all that surprising that this occurs um, um, in the wake of Easter. Um, often pogroms occur in the wake of other springtime festivals, not necessarily Easter. Um, and, um, and there's fear, there's continued fear in Kishnev that there'll be more violence um, at uh, the next religious holiday. So um, to further complicate the, the answer, the mayor of the town, a man named Schmidt, uh, there are all sorts of Ger Ger Germans, 
um, or German people of ancestry in the administrative apparatus of Russia, including Schmidt, is, um, is during the pogrom and before and afterwards enormously friendly to Jews. Um, and um, the uh, governor general um, is probably no more antithetical to Jews than anyone else in his position. It's normative at the time to dislike Jews. Um, the far right, um, this is one definition um, that one, 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 one uses a tongue in cheek of anti, of anti Semites is someone who dislikes Jews more than is necessary. And um, <laughs> so um, uh, the, uh, 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 so the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the worst of the violence is localized, and it's localized in the poorest or among the poorest of neighborhoods, um, right next to the edge of town, uh, right next to a, a, a river that runs just near the town. Um, the, the better neighborhoods um, end up not experiencing quite as much violence, but it, it takes a couple of years before um, Lower Kishnev, the most blighted neighborhood, is rebuilt to the extent to which it's, it's rebuilt. And, um, and so, yes, in the wake of this riots, like urban riots that we've seen in the United States and elsewhere, life goes on the next Sunday and Monday. Yes. I'll take one. I'll get you a minute. I read a book called The Journeys of David Pope by yes. Carol Malkin. Mm -hmm. As a, as a cheeky graduate student, I remember reviewing it and lacerating it, but I can't remember it either. And, uh, and I had so little recollection that I, I did not remember that it dealt with Kishnev. And, um, but um, that's, um, that's all that I can say about it. And uh, I'll, I'll try to find it and reread it, or at least read my nasty review. We'll try and get as many <laughs> questions in as we can, um, yes. You write about the trials of the perpetrators. Was that Uh, yeah, yes, definitely. I mean, the, the Russian judicial system is westernized, if you will, in the 1860s, and, um, and perpetrators of anti-Jewish activities are brought to trial. And, um, and contrary to what tends to be believed about Kishnev or, or other anti-Jewish attacks, um, the army, once it's called to act, does act and it stops the attacks. It's not called to act until the middle of the second day, not because of anti-Semitism, but because the army is loath to put down civil unrest and loath to be used for civil unrest. And um, the governor general is mostly bumbling and, simply, and figures that he can handle it on his own with his own um, um, outmanned police force. And so it's, it's within a couple of hours of the army being called to put down the pogrom that is put down. And, um, and the, um, the trials are serious affairs that go on, as I said, for six, seven months after, after, after the pogrom. Uh, we, have, um, we have similar judicial material for the uh, Gomel pogrom um, a couple of months later in September 1903, where there is actually an organized Jewish effort at resistance. I think the, um, the painting in the, the hallway probably is inspired more by Gomel than by Kishnev, because the Jewish Socialist Labor Bund and Russian and, and Marxist Zionists are at the helm of, of defending it. But the Gomel pogrom, the transcripts of the Gomel pogrom um, uh, trials uh, are uh, 1,300 pages long and dense. And, um, and um, soon after finishing this book, I had to get new glasses. So, so I, I know how long they are and how detailed they are. Take one from that side of the room. Yes. Of course, yeah. There's there's a lot of um, um, uh, uh, ch chicken feather imagery 
um, in the wake of the Kishnah pogrom and elsewhere. Um, uh, a number of uh, correspondents, I, I think it was either, I think the London correspondent for the London Times in reporting on the Kishnah pogrom speaks about the, um, the prevalence of chicken feathers on the streets um, in the wake of the pogrom <coughs> and talks about um, the incredible hunger that Jews have for poultry. And, and, and consequently, how Jewish homes are filled with chicken feathers. And consequently, when ransacked, chicken feathers end up, end up on the streets. Um, uh, the, um, um, the, the, the first um, places attacked by pogromists are, um, are liquor stores. And, um, and um, with their contents either um, um, Dr drunk by the um, rioters or spilling into the streets. Um, and so by the time that houses are ransacked, mostly beginning on the second day of the pogrom, you have actually the remains of liquor stores spilling into the streets. It rains on the early morning of the second day, and so there are rain puddles that augment the water on the second day. And, um, and then, that's, then you have added chicken feathers from the ransacked, ransacked homes. And so those, um, those images are among the most resonant. Uh, but did you want me to say more? No one asked about uh, the legacy of rape and Oh, rape. Yeah. Um, so that, that's um, among the most difficult aspects of the pogrom to document, um, unsurprisingly, for this pogrom and, um, and for the immeasurably more of devastating pogroms of 1918-1921. In, in, in a recent dissertation finished by a student at Brandeis, who documents, I think, rather successfully that um, um, rather than the 60,000 Jews who were estimated to have been killed in these uh, pogroms um, perpetrated by a wide range of perpetrators between 1918 and 1921, rather than 60,000 Jews being killed, uh, the number is closer, she argues, to 200,000. Um, with um, a fair amount of documentary evidence. And she argues that there probably were as many rapes, and, um, but almost all unrecorded. Um, unrecorded um, uh, by married women because of fear that their husbands will divorce them. And there are good many incidents of that in the wake of the Kishnah pogrom by, by, by married women because they're worried their husbands will divorce them by unmarried women because they fear that they'll consequently be seen as, as, as soiled. The, 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 um, the story of the impact of rape, often multiple rape, uh, in some cases um, six men raping the same woman um, uh, consecutively, um, that story is yet really to be told. I dug out of um, the Russian, Hebrew, and Yiddish material as much as I could. But, but by and large, um, it's been encased in silence. And, um, and, um, and, and frustratingly, Frustratingly so, and um, the um, what's curious, and and John touched on this earlier, is that in the wake of the pogrom, rather than focusing on the the violence done to women, the primary focus on the part of Jewish ideologues is of the shameful behavior of Jewish men, and um, that um, that was among the more disturbing um, 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 features of the work that I did. I'm not sure that I could say much more than I've said in the book. I tried in the book to provide documentation for every incident that I, I, could, I, I, I could locate. Hold the thing up closer when you speak. Maybe one more. Uh, yes, one. So if it's inaccurate that the uh, authorities did not uh, uh, cause the uh, uh, pogrom. To what extent was there, did the authorities, the Russian government of some sort, uh, have a hand in others, such as Odessa and the one, I'm, I don't want to go to 1917 or 18, but the other ones, generally at that same time period, Odessa is not that far from Kishina. Right. The, the, the general consensus among historians is that this, the, 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 the government itself um, does not uh, initiate pogroms. Among the greatest fears of the imperial government 
is anarchy on the streets, and especially in the countryside. The majority of riots in Imperial Russia are in the countryside. The majority of people who live in Imperial Russia live in the countryside. And, um, and there are large numbers of rural riots that terrify um, um, the, the government, governmental authorities. It is true, um, and we do have considerable evidence, that in the midst of the um, constitutional crisis of 1905, 1906, where the government agrees to a kind of legislative body to be introduced in Russia, um, which is seen as by the government, which is seen by many as the government capitulating to insidious forces um, and especially Jewish forces. There are officials on the ground who do collaborate with pogromists, but the notion that it's the government that it's a government that actually in a coordinated way is responsible for these attacks is predicated both on the assumption that nothing that hap nothing of great importance that happens in Russia could happen without the involvement of the government, which helps maintain the stability of the imperial regime. But it's not accurate. The, the imperial regime has far fewer policemen at its employ at the turn of the 20th century than in France. And, um, but it's believed to be immeasurably more powerful um, and in control than, than it is, which helps it, it sustain itself into 1917. You know, by any measure, it's a really successful autocratic st uh, story. Um, um, and above all, because the Plevin letter is believed. The Plevin letter in many ways consolidates, consolidates the notion of dis the, the distrust <coughs> on the part of Jews especially, that conservatism is inimical to Jews that um, the arch-conservative government, Russia, the most conservative government of its time, actually plans attacks on Jews. In many ways, the marriage between Jews and the left, a part of the marriage that I personally are part of the consummation of, um, is, 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 is consolidated as a result of the, of the Pleva letter, which itself is a forgery. And um, there are many, many reasons to, for Jews to dislike imperial Russia a plentitude of, of reasons, but, the, but, 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 but not um, as the fermenter of pogroms, which the central government is not. Um, thank you very much. OK. You, oh, wait, wait, wait. So, just a second. You had asked about a reliable uh, account of the uh, Kishinev pogrom. Uh, it just so happens there is one for sale at the back of the room <laughs> that uh, Steve will be happy to, uh, to sign. You see, they talk about tension between UC Berkeley and Stanford, and none, 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 whatsoever, on none whatsoever. <laughs> uh, so I want to thank Steve for a writing such a wonderful book and for treating us to your idea thoughts about the book and about the program today. And thank you for coming.